Good evening, ladies. How are you tonight? Welcome, welcome. We're super excited to be here again, just as a way of a reminder. <laughs> uh, there are no activities on campus next week as it is Rockdale County's fall break, so we will be all taking some time off and we will resume the following Wednesday, whatever date that is. October 11th. October 11th. I won't be here though, I'll be on the ocean cruising with my husband, so for our 40th anniversary. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, <laughs> So anyway, tonight we're super excited as we dig into the second part of second half of Mark chapter six. And um, for those of you that were here on Sunday and had the blessing and privilege of hearing our executive pastor, and he talked about the greatest miracle that we all want to see miracles, but if we have placed our faith in Christ, we have already experienced the most incredible, greatest miracle that could ever be taken from death to life. So, and then as I was reading Mark today, this was my big takeaway. Sometimes I lose sight of the humongous miracle because I'm in a storm. And like, God, you can raise me dead to life, but you can't take care of this storm. So tonight I have a feeling that Karen's probably going to elaborate a little bit on that. But my prayer for me and for all of us is that we just find the peace and the rest in the storm because there's nothing that he cannot do and he loves us so and he's faithful so let's pray father thank you uh, for reminding us that you are able you are faithful you are compassionate you go out of your way and sometimes storms are just what we need to teach us to trust you more so lord let us not be engulfed by the storms of life, Lord, but that we would just fix our eyes on you and trust that you can do all things because you are able and you're faithful. So Lord, I pray God tonight that you would um, empower Karen with your message of truth, that you open her mouth with boldness to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, that we would encounter the living Savior tonight and that you would grow our hunger and our desire to encounter you each and every day because you're so worthy. And we just say thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, some of y'all know and have heard me talk that my son, my oldest son, just got married a week ago Saturday, not even two weeks yet. And, um, it was such a lovely ceremony, and to see my son, he was so happy. You know, normally it's the bride that's all excited about getting married, but my son was over the top happy about uh, getting to marry this wonderful girl. And he, it was just wonderful for me as mom to see him be jo so joyful on his wedding day. But they finished their honeymoon last Friday, and Monday was back to work and back to uh, school for him too. And so. He's in college, he's at his third university, <laughs> and uh, we say that he's taking the scenic route through higher education, <laughs> right? And so he's decided that he wants to further his education by getting a mechanical engineering degree to add to what he already has. So uh, he, uh, if you know anything about engineering, it's like math, like a lot of math, like really, really hard math. So I was talking to him on Monday and, you know, asking him, you know, because he had to, he, all his professors let him take a week off for his honeymoon, and so he's trying to catch up. So he texted me this picture of what he was working on, <laughs> and I'm like, what is that? <laughs> so I was, uh, I don't even know what most of those symbols are, let alone knowing how to go to solve it. Maybe some of y'all are engineers or here. somebody's in here who's like, oh yeah, I know that, but... Not me. Uh -huh. and so as I was looking at that and talking to him about it, I got to thinking about math. Now, it is not my strong suit at all. You might guess I'm a words gal. And, uh, but I did have to relearn algebra and pre-algebra when I was teaching my kids uh, homeschool. And uh, nothing like this, of course. 
but uh, there were some basics that I do remember from those days. Now, this isn't a math lesson. Just relax if you're going, I've been at work all day. I cannot do math. <laughs> but there are a couple of things I did want to point out from math. Now, remember, God is the author of math, and we just kind of, we didn't invent math. People didn't invent math. We just invented a way to talk about the laws that God put in the world, and that's what math is. But in mathematical equations, equations, this is really, really, really simple. There are what's called constants and, it's called, and what's called variables. A constant has a fixed numerical value, while a variable can be unknown or it can change. And for example, really simple, 3 plus x. So 3 is the constant. That is, 3 is always 3, no matter what. It doesn't change. It is not open to discussion. It is not about your feelings when you come in and do your math problem about what it is. 3 does not ever identify as 5, 11, or 37. 3 is always 3, right? And so then x there is the variable. By definition, a variable is able to change. So if we say x is 2, then the answer would be 3 plus 2 is 5. If it, the variable is 10, then the answer is 13. If it's 50, it's 53. If the variable is 1 half, then 3 and a half is the answer. So all you know from here is that, uh, that the answer to the problem here would be 3 more than wherever you started. That's what that is. Very simple there. And so, but you know that the, the uh, principle of constants and variables is in the spiritual world as well as in just basic math. So let's look at a couple of people in the Bible before we jump into today's lesson. Think about Joseph from the Old Testament. Lots of variables in his life, right? If you put his, his dad was a variable, and if you put him into Joseph's life, then the answer then for Joseph is that he's blessed. He's the favored son, and he has all kinds of privileges. That's such a switch out dad for the brothers. Now we have a whole different thing that happens to him. It's not blessed anymore. The answer to what that, that equation is that he's sold into slavery. He's tossed in a pit and he uh, doesn't, he's not home anymore. And so you can add different things in there. Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, the jailer, the baker, the butler, and Pharaoh himself. Uh, and you have a whole lot of different things that happen in Joseph's life because of all these variables. But there is a constant, and the constant is God. And if you read that story from 30, Genesis 37 all the way to 50, you'll see a phrase that keeps showing up, and that is, the Lord was with Joseph. And that's the constant throughout the story that it never changes. Or think about Moses. He has lots of variables, too. Just think about the places that he lives only. Uh, start with, he, he was in a, a born to slaves, and he was... In Egypt, in Egyptian slavery, but that didn't last very long. So then the, the, the uh, variable of where he lives changed to the Egyptian palace, and he's raised with privilege, and he's raised as uh, in Pharaoh's, house, Pharaoh's household. And then later on, much later on in the story, he ends up being a shepherd. His location changed again. That's another variable, and he ends up in Midian as a shepherd, and for 40 years in the desert, you know, the Israelites that he's dealing with, they blame him, they blame God. There's all this stuff that's going on here, and the constant is what? Once again, it's God. He says right in the beginning of the story, in uh, Exodus chapter 3, he says, I will be with you. And that's the constant from that story. And we can talk about Abraham, or David, or Elijah, or any of the prophets over in the New Testament. We have the disciples. Paul and Stephen, all kinds of stories where there are lots of variables, lots of things that change in people's lives there. But there's one constant in every single one of them, and that's God. These things, of course, aren't limited to Bible people, right? We have them too. You have lots of variables that happen in your lives, jobs, relationships, ministry opportunities, tragedies, uh, uh, joyful things that happen to you. And sometimes you've heard from God. And you're heading into something, and you think, and a lot of times we have this idea that if I've heard from God, and he's saying go this direction, then everything's going to be smooth. There aren't going to be any variables. Well, that's not the case. We all know that, right? And you end up far away from where you thought you were going to be with a life that looks very different. And the result of that is you're sitting here thinking, 
wow, I'm really dazed by what's going on in my life. I don't know what's happening. And there's one frustration after the other in your job. There's some health thing that just keeps nagging at you. There's some tension in that relationship that just won't go away. And you're thinking just like all these other guys, God, I know I heard from you. I know what you're saying, your word. But why aren't things working out right? I just can't figure out the answer to what's going on here. And with those, those, those kinds of times come in our lives, how do you feel? What happens to your relationship with God, right? One of two things, right? You're either drawn closer to him, like he's the only thing you have, because he really is, or, uh, and that's the right response, and we hang on to him, like, like you know, our very life depends on it, or we feel like God is very far away. You probably know some people in your life who have come up to a frustrating moment in their life, and their response was to these failed expectations is they turn their back on God forever and say he can't be trusted. He can't be trusted because they couldn't figure out what was happening. And the equation from their vantage point just didn't work out right. And uh, they, it doesn't end up with the answers that they thought that they would get. Now, this is such a common response because no matter how many times we hear Bible st uh, sermons, or we hear Bible studies, or read books, or we listen to podcasts, or whatever it is, we tend to equate uh, God's constant presence in our lives only with good times, right? So if I'm having good times, then that means God's here, God's paying attention, God's working in my life, things aren't so good, then maybe he isn't as constant as he says at all. That's kind of where we land a lot of times. I mean, think about it. If you have a new job or a new relationship, things are going well, how often do you talk about, well, God is blessing me, right? God is blessing me because all these wonderful things are happening. But have you ever heard somebody who is experiencing a loss or a downturn or a struggle or adversity say that they feel like God is blessing them? You don't hear that, right? The scripture tells us a different story. It talks about pruning. It talks about sifting. It talks about molding. It talks about refining, which are all painful processes, right? They are all God's tools for making us usable instruments for his service and molding us into the image of Christ. Uh, and to be used by God is a blessing, right? No matter how it comes to us, if he's using us, he's making us more like himself, that is a blessing. And so sometimes the presence of difficult circumstances is evidence of his constancy, not the opposite. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when things go awry and we have difficulty and hardship, we need to bring our lives into alignment with what the scripture says and not go by our feelings. So how do we handle these situations? Uh, what are we learned to, to learn from these situations that come up? And especially if it seems like you're trying really hard to do what God has told you to do, but what you're facing is hard to solve. This is that problem from Ryan's notebook. It looks crazy. There's no way I can figure it out. Um, and it seems to us like there's shifting variables all over the place, and we're having trouble finding the constant one there. And so what's God trying to teach us? And so I think the answer can be found to these constants and to these variables is in Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 56. And when we marry it with the other gospel accounts of the feeding of the 5,000, which, by the way, just as a side note, is the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle besides the resurrection that's in all four gospels. Um, so you need, uh, this is really important, so we need to learn something, right? If it's important enough for all four of them to include it, we need to spend some time in it. And Mark tells us specifically that there is a connection between the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water that we're going to talk about today. But sometimes these stories are so familiar to us, or we divorce them as either are two separate miracles that we miss the very practical application that Jesus was trying to communicate to them and to us. So, um, now, this is the same pattern. Remember a few weeks ago when we were talking about the parable of the seeds and the mustard seed and the lamp under the bushel, and then we went right into the story of the storm 
on the sea, uh, I've told you that this is a pattern that shows up in Mark, and that is teaching, testing for the purpose of trusting. And this is what we're going to see today in the two stories today. This is what he is trying to teach them. So we're going to go through the feeding of the 5,000 first. And this, this story starts in Mark, uh, Mark chapter, uh, uh, that should be six, Mark chapter six, verse 30. And so uh, um, he says here that they gathered back together and Jesus reported them all they had said and all they had done and all they had taught. And so this was referring back to a section that we didn't talk about last week in Mark, at the beginning of Mark chapter 6 and verse 6, where Jesus has sent the disciples out two by two to go and share the good news with the surrounding area. So they've been gone, and they come back and uh, report to Jesus everything that's going, going on. That's, so that's where these, uh, the disciples have been. And so they convene, reconvene here. And the first three, the first few verses here say that there were so many people coming and going that he didn't even have a chance to eat. And so the people, crowds are pressing in. Jesus is very popular, as you can imagine, all the miracles that are going on. And so they're pressing in, and Jesus says, let's get out of here. Let's go get some rest. And so they sail off, but the crowds see them leave. And when the boat approaches land, guess what? The crowds are there to greet them. Now, and, uh, and so that's what it says here. They saw a large crowd. And Jesus' response here is he's got to be tired and hungry as well. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So he picks up right where he left off with more teaching. And so this is the teaching. Now, we do not have the content of what the teaching was here. We can imagine that it was more about the kingdom of God. Uh, uh, but so they spent hours now listening to Jesus teach here. So, uh, so they've got the teaching. The disciples have heard what he said. So it's time for a test for the disciples. And so he says, by this time, it was late in the day. Mark says this twice. It's late in the day. And then they say it's already very late. So it's, it's here that he can almost feel the tension of the disciples here because they're tired, they're hungry, and they're trying to give a hint to Jesus as if he's forgotten what time it is. And that, hey, it's time for dinner. We still haven't eaten. <laughs> and so they were supposed to be headed for, to this place for rest and relaxation, uh, but that's not what happened. And so maybe they're a little annoyed. Maybe they're frustrated with what's going on here. But let's give the disciples the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they are genuinely concerned about the people who don't have anything to eat and their hearts are in the right place. But they're tired, traveling, ministry, all this stuff. They probably do, really don't want to manage all of these people anymore. So the only thing that they can come up logically with is to send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and buy themselves something to eat. And that phrase, send them away, is an imperative. So they're telling Jesus what to do and not offering it as a, a suggestion. He's saying, this is urgent. Do it now. And so here's the test. And actually in John chapter 6, in his version of this story, he actually says that this is a test, that Jesus was testing them here. So Jesus then delivers a, 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 an imperative back to them. So they say, they're they're suggestion is send them away and he's saying you give them something to eat and do it now that's the implication there and so they have up to this point never considered the possibility that jesus can multiply food uh, even though they some of them have been at the wedding of cana when the water was changed to wine peter james and john have seen somebody resurrected from the dead just jairus's daughter all of them saw the woman with the issue of blood be healed, and they've seen leopards healed, they've seen paralyzed people raised, so they know that Jesus can do miracles, but they are too busy trying to find a human solution to this problem and have not factored in Jesus and his power into the situation. So here's what they come up with. They say it would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much bread and give them something to eat? So their plan is either send the people away, let them handle themselves, or how we're going to find enough money to go and buy them something. So their response is not a response of faith, but of sight. In other words, they respond again with that human reasoning and logic about the amount of money that it's going to take to feed the multi 
multitude. So they failed this test. And so Jesus steps in and he says, how many loaves do you have? He asks, go and see. Now, this is just an aside. We've spent the whole time talking about this. But what, uh, just a point to take away from this right here is that usually when God provides for our needs, he often starts with what we already have. Okay, think about that for a minute. Jesus did not ask, ask them to go out and locate all the bread in Bethsaida, uh, which the disciples didn't have. He said, go and find out what you do have. And he used the five loaves and two fish that they did have. So Jesus doesn't ask us to give us what we don't have, but he asks us to give what we already have most of the time. Uh, it might be a job you have, it might be a skill or a talent, something that is underdeveloped, something that's been lying dormant in your life that he wants you to find out what's in there and then put it to use. And maybe the first thing he says to us when we say, God, what's your will for me is go and see what's already there in your life that needs to act, be activated. And, you know, when I first stopped, was, uh, taught my very first Bible class, uh, Many years ago, I was scared to death. I mean, I thought I was going to throw up. <laughs> I was so nervous and scared because before that, I sat on the very back row of Bible classes, and I never said the first word. I didn't raise my hand. I, if I knew the answer, I never said anything. I was very quiet on the very uh, in the back. And uh, but I had from through my job at In Touch been given the privilege of handling God's word and sermons. For years and years and years. And God said very plain to me, it's time to get off the back row and share what's already been given to you. So he had been pouring into me for years and years and years. And he finally said, share what you have been given. And that's how I ended up here. <laughs> and uh, he said, so he just says to us, see what you have. What is there? Now let me bless it. And they go and give it to others, just like he says to the disciples here. So we can be really, really foolish sometimes when we sit idly by and we pray for God to give us something that extra when we haven't used what he's already poured into our lives, right? I mean, this starts with your Bible, right? This starts with your Bible here. You have access. If you live in the United States, you have access to virtually every translation out there. You, you can go and get a, a paper copy if you want to. I mean, for heaven's sakes, go to Goodwill. You can get one for $2. Or if you're a member here, we will make sure you have one if you don't have one. So there are so many guidelines and answers and promises and revelations of who he is in this scripture. And uh, so we often ask and pray. I'm asking God for wisdom. I'm asking God for provision. I'm get, a, asking God for guidance. And what we want is him to drop something extra down in our lives. But what we don't do is bother to look at what he's already given us. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you are asking and wondering and waiting, open up this Bible right here and see what he has already provided for you. I mean, why would God give you extra special revelation about something that you're seeking if you don't bother to read and apply what he's already given you? Okay? And this is a tremendous treasure. It is a wealth and a privilege for you to have this in your hand. Everybody in this world does not have this privilege. And we are so fat with what we have that we have become lazy. We need to invest in this wonderful word of who he is and use what he has already given us. So... They find the loaves and fish, and according to John's gospel, this just confounds the disciples even more. They say, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? So they don't have an expectation when they bring this. They're like, this is no way. This is not going to happen. Basically, they're saying this isn't even enough for us. Remember, we haven't eaten either. This is just five little loaves. There's 12 of us plus you. That's 13. And, and so, but Jesus is trying to get them to see, you know what, you're right. Logically speaking, rationally, from a human standpoint, it isn't enough. But when you factor him into the equation, then yes, it is more than enough. Mark uh, 
6.39 says, Then Jesus directed them to sit down in groups on the green grass, and they sat down in hundreds and in fifties. He's very orderly. Jesus is not in a hurry. He's not panicked. He's not stressed. You know, imagine how long it took to, to sit 5,000 people down orderly like this. And then he says, Taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. This, by the way, is the way that devout Jews would pray back then, not eyes closed, head bowed, and hands together like we do today. A devout Jew would open into their eyes, throw their head back, reach their arms out like this in expectation of God answering their prayer. That's the way that they would uh, pray back then. Uh, and it's an important point to note here at the end of this verse. He said, then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people and divided the two fish among them. And that Jesus doesn't bypass the disciples here. Even though they have failed their test and they're still wondering what's going on here, he could have easily said, sit down and watch these guys. Let me take care of this. But he doesn't do that. He could have done the miracle without them. He didn't need them. But he fed the people through the disciples' hand. And he could have had them filed by, pick out a piece of bread, keep going, like the, uh, the oil and the flour with Elijah that just never ran out. He could have magically dropped it from the sky. I mean, he did that with man, right? <laughs> he can do that again. Or he could have done it any way he wanted to. But he uh, and chose to involve the disciples in this, which is another principle in this story, you can only give to others as you first receive from Christ. That is, he works in you, and then he works through you, right? The disciples were totally dependent on Christ for feeding and, supply, and supplying their, the need in this moment. And everything that they and the crowd needed came through Jesus, but it, then it came through their hands. That's the lesson there. And that's what Jesus wants them and us to learn. Teaching, testing for the purpose of trusting. Remember that. So here's the result. They ate were satisfied. The disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of men who had eaten was 5,000, not counting women and children. So it could have been twice that. Uh, so this is a great story of God's provision. And not just barely enough, more than enough way more than enough and i think this is a beautiful picture of ephesians 3 20 and that is that he can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine it's overflow abundant more than enough not just like the baskets right so before the disciples were worried we don't have enough to eat with just these five it's not enough for us now each one of the disciples has a full basket full of food and so they so this is god Give him what you have, and then trust him to see how he provides. Now, it might not be how, when, or where we think it's going to be, but he doesn't leave us empty. More than enough. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, then comes Mark's favorite word, Ephesians, uh, uh, Mark 6, 45. Immediately. So, Jesus uh, says, he says, let's get in the boat and Let's go, and, and, and well, he sends the disciples into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida, and he withdraws to pray after he dismisses the crowd. And he says, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. Uh, now, and so he says here, he goes on, he saw the disciples straining at the oars, there now the word straining here means severe distress uh, or affliction or torment if you remember the story from the the demon possessed man diablo from a couple weeks ago and the the uh the, the demons come up to jesus first thing they say is don't torment me same word here so this is it's really hard this is not just out for a little row it, they are being tormented by this wind and on this lake here and so notice that the disciples uh, that he saw the disciples. He's watching them. He's watching what's going on here. And he knows that they're having a tough time. And then it says after the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. 
So this would be the, the fourth watch of the night is probably between 3 and 6 a.m. So they could have been out there from 6 to 10 hours fighting this uh, wind and these waves. And this is the test, right? Uh, is he going to ask, are they going to ask for his help or just to continue to do it themselves? And so he waits till they were at the height of their frustration for him to walk out to them. And then it says, I like this, he was about to pass them by. So he wasn't coming out to rescue them. He was just going to go on across the lake and, uh, and, and, and just bypass them if they hadn't called out to him. So then they said they saw him walking on the lake and thought he was a ghost. And they cried out because all, all saw him and were terrified. So nobody had ever walked on water before. So they weren't expecting to see Jesus out there, but... No one had ever fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish either. And then he says, immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And he climbed in the boat with them and the wind died down. We've seen that before in the last storm on the sea. They were completely amazed for they not understood about the loaves. Their heart were hardened. And right there in verse 52 Here's where Mark connects the two stories. They have not understood about the love, so there's a connection and a relationship here. So it's not an isolated teaching. It's teaching the same thing. And that is, the lesson is that they couldn't feed all the people with a little bit of food. They were powerless to feed those people by themselves. They needed Jesus to make that work. They also needed to invite them, invite him in on their struggle out on the sea. As well. See, I think Jesus watching them, he was waiting to see if they were going to ask for help. And or they're just going to gut it out. They're going to use their human strength, their human reasoning, their logic to make it happen on their own. Now, the Gospel of Matthew tells us that this part of the story is about where Peter gets out of the boat. Uh, and now, if Mark does not include that in his letter, if you're maybe wondering why. Uh, remember that the source material for Mark's gospel mostly comes from Peter. So either maybe Peter didn't want to be exalted for getting out of the boat, or maybe he was humble because he sank. So it's not included in Mark's <laughs> gospel. But then Peter, you know, factoring what Matthew tells us in there, kind of got the gist of what was going on. And there was a connection between the teaching and the testing, and the point is to trust him. That is, if it's you, Jesus, tell me to come out and I'll walk on the water too. And we kind of give Peter a hard time for failing because he saw the winds and the waves. But let's give him a passing grade for getting out of the boat, okay? <laughs> I mean, he trusted Jesus enough to do the impossible. That was the point. That's the goal that we trust Jesus even more when it doesn't make logical sense. The point Jesus was making here. Uh, in this twofold test with the loaves and the walking on the water is that if you ask something for us to do something, we have to always include his involvement. We must factor him in to that equation. And when we do, everything becomes possible. Now, here's our big mistake we get, uh, we're guilty of. And what we do is when God calls us to do something, we evaluate assignments from him according to our ability and forget to factor in the intervention of Christ. We take God's call on our life or his commands or what he wants us to do or where we think he's leading us. And, and we think, Lord, thanks for the command. And we salute and here off we go, right? We're going to do it on our own strength. We're going to do it in our own efforts. And we're going to talk to people through. We're going to work it out. And we're going to go around and around and around that mountain again like we talked a couple uh, uh, weeks ago and consequently we're just like the disciples that we're sitting out on the lake rowing and rowing and rowing and we're not getting anywhere and we ended up being frustrated and tired and exhausted and we we're terrorized by all kinds of wild thoughts and all kinds of things and many times God is just standing over on the shore going okay so you're going to ask me to join in you're going to ask me to help you and he's waiting out there till we reach the height of our frustration because their boat's never moving, and we just want to quit and say, hey, this thing ain't working. I can't do this anymore. And Jesus says, good. That's exactly where I want 
you. I never meant for you to do it by yourself anyway. So we have to remember that when God presents us with a challenge, he intends to be involved in the process. But if you try to do it your, your own way, with your best guess, using your logic and reasoning powers, you will fail because God always calls people to do things where there are holes in the problem, holes in the program. That is a built-in, that is a given. There are things that you won't see your way clear to do because you're not omniscient. You don't know what the real plan is. I mean, we think it's A over here, and God's like, that's not my concern at all. I'm focused on what's going on over here. So we need his wisdom. We need to lean on the Holy Spirit. We need to ask for him to show us. And we need to invite him in and say, I can't do this. I don't know what's going on here. If you don't do it, it's not going to happen. And you probably have heard Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. If this is not a memory verse, you need to put this in your head. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. So if you're in one of those situations where you feel like you are totally frustrated, then perhaps you need to back up and reevaluate what's going on from the beginning. Start with trusting the Lord. Not leaning on your own understanding. I mean, this is where we get messed up all the time. We lean on our own, under, own understanding and don't trust the Lord. We trust me. And so that's, that. I mean, how many times have we done that and how does that turn out? Not good. <laughs> it's like we think we, we need to learn that. So we need to learn to back up and say, in fact, for Jesus into that situation. We need to stop looking for human solutions and look for a supernatural one. Uh, does he want you to keep straining against those oars and to try to keep going and get where you can the best way you know how? Or do you need to call out for help to him and say, I need you, Lord. If you don't do it, it's not happening. He is ready to act if we will just ask. Here's the kicker. you got to listen to what he says and follow. So to wrap, wrap up tonight, I wanted to share this uh a little quote I found when I was working on this. Now, in the context of where I saw it, it had nothing to do with spiritual stuff. It's one of those little pithy little things that you see. I'm, I think this was off Pinterest where I saw it originally. But uh, So it wasn't re related to God at all, but applied to what we're learning through Mark, this section of Mark, I think it has powerful application. And that is, when things don't up, add up, Subtract yourself. Mm. That's good, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's really good. I mean, it's exactly what the disciples needed to do in both incidents. Incidences. It's like, don't focus on it. Back to the beginning with the math. Don't focus on the variables so much. Subtract yourself from it. Rely on the constant. And that is Jesus himself. That he never changes. And we can rely on that. The winds blow and storms come up and we think we see a ghost out some, there some way and things are changing wildly all around us. He never does. That is the promise of scripture. You can bank on that. What he says in his word about himself will never change. That's the only thing that won't change. I mean, you're going to change. The world's going to change. People are going to change. But he does not. He is the constant. And though your situation might look like my son's math problem from the beginning, mm. you, can, you can trust that he is the only immovable constant. And he is always the right answer. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that you are constant. And our world is so crazy right now. It seems like we wake up every day and something new crazy is happening out there. Mm. It's so easy to look at the waves all around us, to hear the storm blowing in our ears, and be afraid. But God, help us to lift our eyes up to you, to call out to you who are ready and willing and able to save us, to guide us, to lead us, even through the most crazy things that happen to us. God, thank you that you don't change, and we can trust you. In your son's powerful name we pray. Amen.